Hi everyone. In today's session, I'm going to talk about how we at Warner Brothers Games ingested game telemetry data in near real time into Redshift using Airflow in a dynamic way. Yes, the name is long, but um, you know, we'll get into the details so you could understand it and uh, hope you like the session. To start with a little bit about myself, uh, I'm lead big data engineer at uh, Warner Brother Game Analytics team. And in my spare time, I love playing video games and also outdoor basketball and cricket. And I'm a huge fan of Celtex and this time I'm really hoping for them to win championship. So at WB Games, we have a large portfolio of games and um, here uh, are a list of few games that are very popular around the world. So we have a large player base across each game. It leads to producing huge volumes of game telemetry data on a daily basis. So with that, uh, we have few landscape requirements. So on a day to day, we have 50 plus game environments that we have to support. And we have gigabytes of uh, data that's produced through the game telemetry data that we have to process on a daily cadence. And on top of that, we, has, we have increasing demand of use cases for the faster data availability from uh, game developers, data analysts, data scientists, so that they can make quick decisions on the gameplay and monetization, monetization using the data like matchmaking, increasing retention, revenue, and many more use cases. With these landscape requirements in, in mind, we built, we, the analytics platform team at WB, created a data pipeline to process this game telemetry data in near real time, that is between five to 10 minutes. So we built this infrastructure a few years back where uh, the WB game slate was just few games. So to start with the data flow, the game clients will send the events whenever the users play the game. So the game clients generate uh, events per each action in the game. And these game clients send these um, events as Avro payload to our internal ingestion service. So we are using Avro data format here so we could support constant schema changes on the game events. So in the game dimension, it's a valid use case and it's a common scenario that uh, whenever there is a game patch, the schema changes for uh, different events and uh, the, the constant schema changes are need to be supported within the game telemetry data pipeline across the uh, data flow and to be processed and be able to load into Redshift. So with that dimension in mind, we do need to support evolving schema and uh, constant schema changes on the game events. So we chose uh, Avro uh, data format uh, because Avro supports schema evolution and uh, it, it, it tightly coupled to the schema and it has fingerprint to track the schema. On top of that, we built our internal schema service framework to support uh, the Avro schemas and validate them and eventually uh, support the schema evolution within the data pipeline. So the event ingestion service acts as a producer to the Kafka and sends these events to Kafka in real time. So these Avro payload will be sent to Kafka in real time after validation from the schema service. So we use Kafka to store the stream of events that can be later consumed by our consumers. So in, in our case, we use Spark Streaming as our consumers and we process the events in a micro batch interval on an EMR cluster. And uh, in this scenario, we follow a single tenant model where we have one EMR cluster per each game environment to reduce the blast radius impact. So we process this data and uh, we save this data into S3 for each table version of the schema. So until now, the flow, as you see, it we have 
n number of uh, games and for each games we have hundreds of uh, event types that means each event is proportional to a table in redshift that means uh, we have hundreds of tables that we need to load and each table will have tens of schema versions that we need to support so all these uh, dimensions will be processed and will be uh, saved in s3 in a specific s3 file path format so once this data is saved in X3, the next step is making this data available for downstream users like our analysts, game developers, and data scientists. As we have adopted uh, the AWS Redshift as our cloud data warehouse for operational purpose, for BI and reporting, downstream ETL queries, ML use cases, and for ad hoc queries as well, we wanted to load this data from S3 to Redshift directly. And for that, uh, we built an internal data loader which is hosted on the same EMR cluster master node where the Spark job is running. And we started with the, just running one copy command for each S3 file uh, so that it loads the data into Redshift. So now that uh, we went through the data flow, let's go into some technical details of uh, how we are loading the data from S3 to Redshift uh, with, with our data loader. So, we want to ingest the data into Redshift and uh, from S3 to Redshift, uh, copy command seems the standard way to load the data from S3 to Redshift. So what is a copy command in Redshift? Redshift copy command is standard way of bulk inserting the data from another source, in our case S3, into Redshift. So the copy command syntax will look like this. So a simple copy, table name, set of columns, from S3 file path, and you have to provide few other properties like IAM, role, region, and depending upon what kind of copy command it is, the properties will change. So on top of this uh, simple copy command structure, you could also load data into uh, Redshift using other dimensions like using S3 manifest or S3 prefix. So S3 manifest is uh, a type of data loading where uh, you create a manifest file for the list of S3 file paths you want to load into Redshift and uh, give the manifest file path reference uh, in S3 in the copy command. What happens in this scenario is um, the copy command is already optimized by Redshift to load bulk data. So when the manifest is specified, it scans through all the S3 file paths within the manifest and it, be, it is optimized to load this data in Redshift in, in, in a more uh, uh, optimal way and uh, you know it takes less time than copying each of the single copy commands in a queue. S3 prefix acts in a similar way where you provide the S3 prefix path and uh, it will scan in S3 all the S3 file paths with the same prefix and it will load the data and it will be a bulk load. So data loading into Redshift will be faster with one single copy command with a bulk load of either S3 prefix or S3 manifest. So once we understood this uh, scenario, we started processing the data uh, with these dimensions. And uh, Coming back to our game telemetry data pipeline, as you see, we now that we understood how the copy command works, we started with initial uh, single copy commands, but then we soon realized we were falling behind uh, with the data availability in Redshift. Our main use case is to make the data available in Redshift in a faster cadence, but we are falling behind on that. And the reasons are, uh, we, our huge game slate uh, that we have, the, ga the games are getting popular, people are playing more games, that means huge volumes of data uh, for each game, right? In that scenario, because of huge volumes, we are trying to process these huge volumes in almost near real time. And uh, with the dimensions of processing this data for each game and hundreds of tables for each game and for each, for each of these tables, we have uh, tens of versions of um, schemas and processing this data and loading this data to Redshift uh, in um, either S3 uh, to Redshift where you are running a bunch of copy commands to data loader. So 
when we load uh, these huge volumes from S3 to Redshift using copy command, it's it's getting slow because you have too many copy commands running in a queue, and uh, you know it's hitting uh, you know Redshift commit queue bottleneck, and uh, you know on top of this, um, we also have increasing de demand of use cases on Redshift. We have a bunch of analysts, bunch of data scientists querying the data on Redshift. That means uh, we have resource uh, constraints on Redshift. Both data loading and data querying are competing for resources on the Redshift side. So this has been a challenge, and this uh, in itself is slowing down the data loading. So what we thought of is having a hybrid model. So we introduced another application called Batch Loader. And uh, what this batch loader does is it takes uh, some of the load from data loader. So for some specific tables, we may not need them very frequently. Some specific tables will need to be available in a very frequent cadence. So the infrequent tables will be loaded through batch loader at a hourly cadence or sometimes even daily cadence. With that, we distributed the data load, but still we haven't solved the root cause of delay of uh, some of these uh, uh, frequent tables that we still not need to load to Redshift and make it available as fast as we can. We are still falling behind on those scenarios, especially with heavy query workloads and also Redshift maintenance windows. So on top of this, we also have uh, some um, uh, resource constraints problem of uh, uh, data loader competing with resources with Spark because they both are running on the same EMR, which uh, uh, led to high CPU, high memory. Sometimes it led to idle process on loader, sometimes uh, unclean uh, killing of some of the threads and uh, not having transactional uh, uh, records, it led to data quality issues. So because of data quality issues, me, which means we are have we end up seeing uh, sometimes gaps and loops. With that uh, issue, we ended up adding another application called Gap Filler, uh, which we run after midnight every day and remediate gaps and loops. But it still doesn't didn't address the core uh, issue that is have uh, having data qualities uh, on a given day. So just to summarize uh, the challenges we have, um, one of them is, uh, and the main one is uh, data loading delays into our data warehouse. And then uh, another important factor is heavy operational overhead. Because of uh, we having multiple applications trying to load the data into Redshift, and because we are not having uh, custom insights or custom metrics uh, to, uh, to analyze the data flow to analyze the behavior of the services and we have to support 50 plus games and we have to support huge volumes and uh, we are uh, running each resource per each uh, uh, a game we have so, so many components to handle and this led to huge maintenance and huge operational overhead on the development team so another issue we discussed was the data quality issue. So having all these challenges, uh, we thought of uh, uh, having to redesign the pipeline and uh, ingest data into Redshift and address all the challenges using Airflow. So until now, you have seen through some of the slides where our data pipeline is having some challenges. So from now on, you will see the current transition of us using Airflow and how we, uh, how we uh, introduced or uh, merged Airflow into our data pipeline and address these challenges we had. So before going and implementing uh, uh, our uh, Airflow DAG, we wanted to come up with a set of features uh, that uh, we absolutely want in our uh, new redesigned uh, data pipeline. So the first is we wanted faster data backfills when data delayed in Redshift. And then we wanted uh, data quality. There is no compromise on that. We do want data quality. And uh, that means no gaps and no dupes having transactional uh, commits and uh, we do want observability and this was one 
big thing we seeing we observability will help us uh, uh, get into the analysis of each of these uh, 50 plus game environments uh, in a much simpler way because we get uh, insights of how this uh, data is getting processed, how these services are performing, uh, getting detailed insight metrics through a, a dashboard uh, will help us identify anomalies and uh, also take uh, precautions and you know preventive measures uh, by uh, defining some auto healing or self healing process. So we do wanted observability around it. And on top of that, we do wanted a unified framework for uh, Redshift data loading because uh, we have few, this will address the operational issues we have because we have uh, few uh, game environments running in its own isolation services and it's hard to maintain these services and uh, you know, it's hard to maintain how each of these uh, uh, threats execution happen in Redshift, not having, uh, you know, clear control on each of in, in n number of environments. We wanted a simplified and a unified framework for Redshift data loading. So with all these features into, ma in, into consideration, which all these uh, things and the challenges we have in, on our data pipeline, and uh, uh, we wanted to go with Airflow. Uh, with, after some research we did, uh, we thought Airflow will address uh, the challenges. And if we are able to implement the DAG in Airflow, we will be uh, able to uh, address uh, the challenges we have and also incorporate the features we were looking for. So to give a little bit brief summary on Airflow, we uh, one of the interesting thing or one of the main thing with Airflow is it's a scheduler based tag workflow. So we, we wanted to switch our model to scheduler based uh, uh, DAG orchestration. So that that uh, helped us uh, with on in moving towards Airflow direction. And we wanted a flexible API to design idempotent task in DAG so we could maintain data quality. So Airflow provided that flexible API so we could design our idempotent task. We want a, a framework or a service that is highly scalable, both vertically and horizontally. And uh, with Airflow, we, we were able to uh, achieve uh, that high scalability. And Airflow have a bunch of built-in features like web UI, variables, connections, retry and alerting mechanism. And uh, we almost used all of these features to an optimal way so that uh, we could take leverage of these resources or these features. And uh, we just focus on coding rather than implementing these features uh, by ourselves. And Airflow has easy integration with external service. Almost it has uh, integration with a bunch of external services. Even if a service integration is missing, you can still add it because of the flexible API. So uh, on top of that, um, we integrated Airflow with a few of our AWS services and uh, Datadog. So now let's get into our uh, Redshift loader. Uh, how we implemented our existing Redshift loader, where we hosted uh, our services on Airflow and we implemented a dynamic way of uh, uh, generating copy commands using our Airflow DAG. So let's get into the details of the data flow of uh, uh, loading data from S3 to Redshift. So first we hosted our um, uh, uh, DAG on Airflow. So we, we implemented our internal logic to build this Airflow DAG. And uh, we have our internal Airflow infrastructure with, with the salary executor and, uh, and the configuration uh, takes care of running the tasks in a distributed uh, workload across multiple workers. And all of this is managed by our internal salary backend. Because of uh, this, uh, and we have enhanced metrics uh, behind our Airflow infrastructure. 
because of uh, such a stable infrastructure we have we were able to process uh, 50 plus uh, game environments and each game is producing huge volumes of game data and uh, we we switched to a multi tenant uh, cluster model say, where we are hosting all our production workloads uh, in a in a single airflow cluster without uh, uh, and and it's because of the high scalability that airflow has with uh, very less uh, or uh, negligible maintenance on top of it so now that we discussed uh, how we are hosting our DAGs on Airflow, let's talk about the data flow. So we implemented an Airflow DAG with the focus of three components in it. The first component is consumer. The consumer takes the S3 file path metadata and it runs every five minutes and uh, it takes it, it calculates uh, the delta between these S3 file paths and the RDS uh, metadata tracking table and copies the new files into the metadata tracking table. So once we, once consumer pulls in uh, all the ready state S3 file path metadata, the controller will, uh, the next task that the controller will kick in and it will, uh, it will pull all the all the S3 file paths uh, that are ready to be processed and uh, the controller will decide, the controller will dynamically uh, decide, uh, you know, what would be the right uh, copy command configuration for this data set. In a normal scenario, it will uh, take all these S3 files, it will uh, create the copy commands depending upon uh, the hundreds of tables we have and, uh, you know, tens of schema versions for each of these tables and, uh, and for each game. And uh, it will send all these uh, copy commands to connector using an XCOM variable. So it sends these uh, copy commands uh, to XCOM and uh, connector uh, it pulls it from XCOM. So the connector has uh, a single task. It just connects to Redshift and executes the copy command. So that's the normal flow. Now let's talk about uh, different scenarios, right? I mean, we talked about dynamic data loading. So now let's talk about different scenarios, how the controller will dynamically load the data, right? So in a normal scenario, the consumer puts in a tracking table, controller takes it, just sends the copy command, generates it and sends it and connector kind of redshift and redshift is, data is loaded, boom. Within within few seconds, the data will be loaded in redshift because, uh, because there is, it's a normal scenario, you know, uh, the redshift uh, is uh, not having any resource constraints. But we, because of the model we are using, we have, uh, uh, we have the same redshift where, uh, you know, users are coding the data, you know, uh, at, at, and maybe the dash, maybe there are a bunch of ETLs that are uh, coding the data from different tables. So basically there is heavy query workloads. There could be all, also scenarios like, you know, there could be a redshift maintenance for a few hours. In all of these scenarios, redshift will be busy, either not or not available. In such scenario, what happens? Right, the day we can't load the data at that time. So what happens is we check the availability of Redshift, and the Redshift is not available. So what we do is uh, we, we we don't uh, uh, try to execute uh, the data, or we don't try to run the copy command, right? Because the Redshift is not available. So let's say the Redshift is available uh, uh, after the maintenance, or maybe after three hours, right? In that case we uh, the controller will uh, identify the right set of uh, data files that are pending to be loaded to redshift let's and it 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 does know that there is 3 hours of delay and it does know that uh, you know we we need to load uh, 3 hours of data in a faster cadence uh, in in a more uh, fast data loading so it can't send one copy command for each file that will take uh, uh, a long and long time to load to Redshift. So what it does is whenever it sees a delay, it aggregates all these S3 files and it defines, okay, there is a delay for uh, maybe, you know, more than a uh, uh, few minutes or maybe 30 minutes or maybe an hour. In this scenario, as I was saying in the maintenance window, it's like more than three hours. So it calculates all these S3 file paths 
and uh, it creates a manifest file for it and it creates a new copy command with the reference to the new manifest file and it sends the manifest file uh, referenced copy commands to the connectors and the connectors will do a bulk loading to redshift using the copy command with manifest reference to it so that run will take maybe few minutes but uh, it will load all the uh, it will backfill all the 3 hours delay so the data is again for uh, available at a very uh, faster cadence when the redshift uh, has no constraints so at least we are able to deliver the data to uh, the users at a faster cadence when redshift supports so and after this scenario in the next run controller sees that the data is already caught up so it it doesn't go to manifest mode again it dynamically de makes a decision that uh, okay it's uh, we don't need manifest again it will go to either prefix mode or like a full path mode depending upon the data set and we also maintain true transaction commits uh, with the maintaining an audit in rds so once a connector executes a copy command it it uh, it maintains an audit and uh, comes those transaction to that audit table so this will address data quality issues so we won't see any gaps or dupes uh, in this scenario and on top of that uh, we also have uh, taken few measures we made sure there are concurrent transactions and threads in connectors that are proportional to the workload management queue of redshift so if if uh, if it supports three threads then we'll have three connect if it supports five threads then we'll have five connect so this can change depending upon the uh, wlm queue on the redshift so that's how we distributedly load copy commands to optimize the workload we also load the copy commands in a batch commit so we could copy few copy commands in a single transaction and reduce the copy commit on top of that uh, uh, we also take care of schema version handling because we make sure different schema versions of the same table are part of the same batch so that it will uh, not end up having race condition of deadlocks meaning if if two schema versions of the same table are sent to two different connectors and they are trying to load to redshift they will block each other and it will went to it will go to a deadlock situation so we try to we optimize the code in a way that we try to avoid all these scenarios and if there are any transactional kills on on the redshift uh, by some x uh, service uh, you know then the copy command will roll back and the files will be again go to ready state and the controller will pick it and process it so you have you are maintaining a true transactional uh, uh, logic here so we we are maintaining data quality here so on top of that i want to mention uh, uh, we defined the data observability and uh, uh, you know data insights by having a by utilizing the integration between airflow and datadog uh, it's a very easy integration uh, uh, that we did and um, uh, using a statsd model and uh, with that integration we were able to collect all the metrics from all these tasks and uh, make them as dashboards in datadog so that really helped us um, in uh, you know getting all the insights of all these uh, hundreds of tables across uh, 50 plus game environments uh, with uh, with one visualization uh, in one uh, in few charts in 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 uh, one dashboard in datadog so th this kind of addressed our observability uh, use case and from datadog we send uh, uh, if you see any anomalies we have an integration with pager duty so we send it to pager duty and uh, pager duty triggers an on call uh, escalation on top of that we utilize some of the airflow features uh, like i was saying xcom variable where uh, you know it shares the copy command information from controller to connector usually xcom is recommended to use for lightweight um, uh, data sets uh, in this case as it is metadata it worked for us but if you are using if you are trying to share data actual data between uh, different tasks xcom may not be the right choice so on top of that we also used an airflow feature called max active runs equal to one with just one single configuration we were able to make sure that uh, if a dag execution is delayed it will not start a new execution 
So that's a feature uh, a, uh, configuration in Airflow. Without that, we would have to build our internal logic to you know handle such race conditions or scenarios. So with all these uh, features, you were able to uh, truly define it, our data flow and able to address uh, some of our challenges. So let's let's summarize uh, this data flow. So we talked about our loader components like consumer, which creates, uh, which captures S3 metadata from S3 files and added to metadata audit tracking table. We have controller that pulls metadata from audit. It dynamically generates copy command for each table version and sends it to connector via XCOM variables. In some scenarios, especially in delay scenarios, it creates a manifest and saves it back to S3 and sends it as reference in the copy command. And then we have connector that connects to Redshift and executes the copy command statements. And uh, we also talked about data loading scenarios, like a normal scenario when no load constraints on Redshift, we have default copy command execution and uh, another scenario where we have heavy query workloads or maintenance, the data loading uh, is for more than an hour or something. In such case, uh, the current batch will complete and the next batch will collect all these S3 files and create a manifest file. So single, it will execute a single copy command with reference to the manifest file. Uh, this scenario we, we talked about in the previous slide. So these are some scenarios uh, of, uh, that addresses uh, faster data backfills. Now, I want to uh, talk a little bit on these metrics uh, to get, give you some insights of how uh, useful, uh, you know, ha to have observability on your uh, data and data processing in uh, services. So if you see on the top, uh, left corner, we have uh, this metric uh, called as data loading lag from S3. So all these uh, colored lines are basically the delay of each table version uh, into Redshift. And if you see, I took a data set of one day and most of the time it's, uh, it's, it's, it's anywhere between five minutes. Uh, so it, it, it's pretty fast in data loading. But in some cases, on some tables, uh, you, you see some spikes. That means uh, there is a delay. And that could happen for a number of reasons. Uh, it could be query workload, it could be uh, X, Y, Z. But the most important thing is in the next run, in the next run, it, it will uh, create a copy command dynamically in a way to collect these uh, files and reference in a manifest file so that it could load a single copy command with the collective reference of all these S3 file paths. So it loads, it, it does a bulk load and it, it is able to process the data at a faster cadence. So the most important thing is we catch up quickly. This is not the scenario previously where there is delay. The delay just goes on and the spike goes on. But uh, in, in, in the current scenario, it, there may be delays, but it will catch up immediately. Now look at the bottom right corner, uh, the connector runtime. And you see the spikes. This, this is runtime spikes, so and it is in seconds. So if, if you do the math, it's kind of proportional to the spikes of um, uh, lag. Uh, so you see a lag when there is a uh, delay uh, in data loading from connector. So th that's why they both are proportional. So there is a delay in, connect, uh, in data loading. That means there is a lag. In the other two dashboards, this is for consumer and this is for controller. And uh, you see the dimension is in seconds. And most of the times it takes one or two seconds, both for consumer and controller. But in some cases, uh, it, it may take few seconds. But uh, the good thing is these are light weighted process, even with huge volumes of data because of uh, the DAG implementation we did, it's always uh, very few seconds uh, uh, for processing time. So it's pretty light weighted. So this is uh, just getting you some insights on how we define data dog metrics. So that helped us uh, define observability and uh, identify anomalies across uh, this huge game slate that we have and that is still uh, onboarding more and more games. So I want to share another feature that we have uh, added. 
that is a, a declarative way of DAG deployment on Airflow. So we, I have, I keep mentioning we have huge slate of games, but that's that, that's just the start of the story. We have huge slate of games uh, that we have to onboard in future. So we have few game deployments uh, every uh, uh, every few weeks. And uh, there is always uh, uh, different environments with that we need to set up. So it's a constant uh, uh, increase in slate of environments and games. So and every time we on we want to onboard a new game, we want to make sure it's it's a more seamless process. And Airflow uh, identifies uh, defining a new DAG for each uh, game environment. So what we do is uh, we just create a JSON variable with the game configuration. Like we maintain a naming convention as game name, environment, and the event type of data. And we add set of configuration requirements for that game uh, ingestion. Like how frequently you want to load the data, you know, how many days back you want to look at the data, which Redshift host you want to connect to, how many connector queues you want. In this case, uh, we specified we want four connector queues. So what should be your uh, manifest window size? What should be the batch window of uh, data volumes? We also have uh, flexibility to include and exclude the tables um, and uh, scenarios like batch size for the commit and retry handling and some email alerting. So th these are just few examples. We also have few other examples. Uh, few, uh, we have a bunch. We have a big list of configurations that we could derive. We change it per game. So each game needs its own set of configuration. So once the, we 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 we, uh, we fix the configuration, what we do is we just check in into Git, and Jenkins pulls it from Git. Jenkins is our CI/CD pipeline. It just pulls uh, the latest configuration from Git. And it deploys this configuration in Airflow as an Airflow variable. And uh, the way we have defined our DAG implementation in a declarative way, that what it means is it will look for all the variables in Airflow. And if a new variable is added, it will scan through its configuration and it will define a new DAG itself. So we are not touching Airflow production. You know, it's it, everything is going through our uh, uh, automation pipeline and the CI/CD approach. And uh, once we lock in our uh, configuration, which you can call code as config, and uh, once it's deployed as an variable, the DAG uh, scans through this variable and identifies the configuration and creates a DAG dynamically. So. Uh, this is the DAG that it created uh, based on the configuration we set up uh, where I specified connector queue count as four. So there are four connectors that created. That means that there are four concurrency threads that are running to load data to Redshift. And we have consumer and controller. In the same manner, we, you can switch different uh, uh, arguments. So let's say if you put connector count as three, then you will have only three connectors. So this is just uh, another nice enhancement we added. So with all these uh, uh, add-ons, this is the current state of our WB game telemetry data pipeline, where uh, some of the components uh, are uh, uh, still the same, but the main difference is uh, loading the data from SC to Redshift. Now we are using Airflow for it, and uh, we, we are running our Redshift loader on Airflow with an audit on Postgres. And we have this in production for almost 18 months now. And I have to say, we are having really good night sleeps. We haven't seen any potential issues with this pipeline as far, and it's quite scalable and able to process huge volumes of uh, games uh, data across multiple game environments. So let's, let's summarize and let's have a review of uh, uh, the features. So we wanted, uh, we, we had a challenge with data loading delays in uh, data warehouse. So we come up with dynamic data loading from Airflow DAG by switching between manifest prefix and full path of S3 in copy command. So this addressed our uh, data loading delays. We have heavy operational overhead uh, before, uh, and we use a unified framework for data loading via uh, Airflow DAGs on a multi-tenant Airflow Celery cluster with custom metric insights. 
that addressed uh, the overhead we are uh, having on the operation side. So we have uh, very uh, easy maintenance uh, right now. And another important data quality issues. Because of the idempotent task we built in Airflow and maintaining transaction logic, we were able to achieve uh, uh, data quality. So with that said, uh, uh, that summarizes uh, the talk uh, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, I just want to mention, uh, we are uh, still investing on data lake models on top of S3 and we also have some interesting use cases like uh, addressing PI data within within uh, within the players so with we with that said if you are interested uh, to talk more about uh, our uh, use cases you are happy to reach out to us and we are also hiring so please uh, click on our careers if you are interested and uh, you know uh, let's see uh, and uh, i'm open for questions now